So really what I have here are three talks in one. Each one of these could be an hour talk, and so I, you, you, know, you, you get uh, triple the, the pleasure. Uh, so, uh, so, so let me start with some premises about public education in 2013. Um, and, and so what I'd say is that while the need for dramatic reform is sort of an open question, there's a lot of political minefields about how you feel about dramatic reform, what I think we probably could all agree upon is that we could do better. Uh, that public schools could do better than they're doing now. And so there's a lot of question about how could we do better and what, what things do we know about and, and how can we learn from what we already know. Um, and another thing that I think is sort of clear is that the economic payoff to a college degree um, as of about now is, is significantly larger than it was even back in 1990. Uh, and the other thing I think is a, a clear premise is that what we're seeing recently is a, sh a gradual shift from school and district level accountability policies to policies that are really targeted towards specific teacher and principal evaluation. And we're seeing more and more states enacting policies that are moving us towards that idea. So just to give you some sense for the, my, my statement on the premise of the return to a college degree, here's a plot from a study uh, that was published uh, last year uh, by economists at Georgetown. Uh, and what I found compelling about this plot is what this plot shows is the ratio of earnings, average earnings, and the red line represents those with a college degree, and it's the ratio of, of earnings uh, for those with a college degree relative to those with just a high school degree. Uh, and what you can see, uh, starting in really 19, over here marks 1990, you can see that there's been a pretty dramatic rise. And at this point, roughly 2013, your earnings, if you're a college graduate, uh, is about twice as large as if you're not a college graduate. So the rhetoric around we need to have students that are ready to go to college is not entirely without merit. Another thing that is a clear premise is what we're seeing in a lot of states is something that's very similar to teacher evaluation as it is, is being considered here in Colorado. And this is the sort of framework that you see for what, what Colorado is, is considering based on the passage of SB 191. Um, and you're seeing a lot of states come enacting something that's fairly similar to this sort of framework. And the framework is such that it starts with a definition of what one means when one speaks of teacher effectiveness. From there, it goes to actually saying, well, what are the quality standards that we would look for to sort of decide whether we had teachers that were effective or not. And so you have these five uh, quality standards that really are on uh, focusing on sort of inputs, teacher practices, things you'd observe if you went into a classroom. And then you have this, this one on the end that's on student growth and is more of an outcome-based uh, uh, standard, right? And from there, you have this idea that there'll be 50% uh, of two, two pieces of evidence that will be used to evaluate teachers. One side will be based on observations of practice. Another side will be based on observations of growth. There'll be some sort of weighting between these two. And at the end, you have this uh, categorization of teachers into four categories, going from ineffective to highly, highly effective. And where the consequences really come down is in this ineffective to partially uh, effective. If a teacher is rated two years in a row as ineffective under this, uh, under this plan, uh, the teacher uh, would lose uh, non-probationary status and it would be conceivable that a teacher could be fired after two years. This is where the high stakes come in. And so this sort of a framework really is, is sort of the launching point for this talk because a lot of the things that are involved in establishing whether a teacher is effective or not so effective are all things that are, that are part of my training and, and they, they lead me to ask certain kinds of questions. And so what I want to give you today are three different perspectives on educational accountability. Okay? Um, one of them is the, uh, what I would call the economic perspective, the per perspective from an economist. Another is what I call the psychometric perspective. Another is what I just call a parent perspective. Now, the fun thing about all these three perspectives is that they're all mine. Uh, because uh, as an undergraduate, I majored in economics. And I carry some of the, the, the thought processes that economists typically have, even though I wouldn't call myself a professional economist. Uh, in graduate school, much of my training focused on psychometrics. Much of what I do today is about psychometrics. And of course, uh, I'm a parent and not just any old parent. Uh, I'm a parent of a special needs child. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is sort of how I grapple with these three perspectives when thinking about educational accountability. Okay, so I'll start with the economic perspective. Those of you who have ever taken an economics <laughs> class uh, might recognize the father of economic theory. Uh, this is Adam Smith. Uh, and and one thing you can take away about the economic perspective is it's really focusing quite heavily on the idea of incentives and what you can do about engendering incentives that can actually lead to efficiencies uh, and lead to sort of desired results. Okay? And what is probably most synonymous with the economic perspective is value-added modeling. 
Okay. And the, the basic, the, 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 the real impetus, value-added models have been around for a long period of time. In fact, most regression models that control for prior achievement are value-added models. They just haven't always been used in the context of thinking about educational accountability. Now, what really launched, I think, value-added modeling into the, the sort of policy domain uh, was this report uh, by uh, Rob, uh, Robert Gordon, K Thomas Kane, and Doug Steger in 1996, uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Gordon Report. Uh, and in this report, they made essentially the following argument, and it goes something like this. First, teacher quality has a significant impact on student learning. And from that, you could say, well, of course. I mean, we, we didn't need anybody to tell us that. That seems sort of self-evident. But what's a little bit different is that a series of studies have sort of demonstrated and attempted to quantify just how much the impact was on teacher quality. And a lot of these studies suggested that teacher quality had a more dramatic impact on uh, student achievement gains than a lot of other manipulable interventions that people had thought about as being possible ways of improving achievement and reducing achievement gaps in the past. So a second part of this premise is that teachers have been historically evaluated on presumed quality inputs rather than student outcomes. And these inputs, as it turns out, when you look for whether they have much of an association with student learning, you find at best mixed results and, and at worst no evidence that traditional measures of teacher inputs have an, a, a strong association with student learning. Um, and so the idea is, therefore, the status quo for evaluating teachers, if it's just based on inputs, is flawed. And so teachers should be evaluated, at least on part, on the value, value they add to student achievement. OK. So uh, a, another way to sort of put this is, like, here's a premise. I'm a big basketball fan. Those of you who know, know me know this. Uh, and so John Wooden had this saying, uh, don't measure yourself by what you've accomplished, but what you should have accomplished given your ability. And this captures pretty nicely the ethos of value-added modeling. OK, so here's a simple overview for those of you who haven't uh, have heard a lot of the rhetoric around value-added but aren't quite sure about what it really constitutes. And I think it's fairly easy to explain the basic idea. The basic idea is not terribly complicated. It goes something like this. In a nutshell, can we predict a student's current test performance based on their past test performance? We can, actually. We can run a simple regression and look at the relationship of one between the other. Then, for each student, we can predict uh, we can compare the test score they actually obtained to the test score that was predicted, right? And when we make that comparison, if the observed test score we see is higher than what was predicted, it looks like the student has done better than we expected. If it's negative, the student's done worse than we expected. And so if you then look within a classroom and observe a teacher that has a lot of these positive values, examples where students have overachieved relative to what you have predicted versus underachieved relative to what you predicted, these are all very suggestive findings, right? And so the question fundamentally is, has a student done better or worse than predicted relative to similar peers? Right? So we can make this more or less complex depending on how we specify our, our prediction equation. Right? So I could, control, I could predict current performance based on just past performance, but I could also predict it as a function of whether a student uh, was, uh, had, was in poverty. I could do it as a function of whether uh, a student uh, was, was in a particular type of class, classroom characteristics. So I can make the prediction equation more or less complex but the basic idea of what I'm after, that is a sense of leveling the playing field by con considering where a student was when they started relative to where they were at, th at the end, is the basic idea. So this is from the Gordon Report. And here was this, this, the sort of results from the Gordon Report that, were, that people found generally very, very compelling. You can see other iterations of this. But um, the tr one traditional measure of teacher quality is certification. Uh, and in the report, what they did was to look at uh, three groups of teachers in, in LA. Uh, and one group was traditionally certified, another group was, was certified through alternative methods, and then there was a group that was uncertified. And then what they did was to essentially compute these, these residuals, predict student performance, and look at whether you're seeing teachers with particularly uh, a large number of, of students who had overachieved or underachieved. And what they essentially saw was the, the distributions on these residuals, on these indicators of performance of the students, there was really no difference between the distributions. And the contrast was that when they, they had three years of data, and when they computed for teachers for the first two years of data, estimates of value added based on essentially averaging these estimates of whether students had over or underachieved, they used that for two years. And then what they did is to look at student performance in the third year and whether gains in the third year could be predicted by what you knew about value added from the first two years. And what they saw is that you could actually see that if you broke the distribution of teachers according to their estimates of value added, into these quartiles, you could actually see fairly meaningful gaps between the distributions. Okay. So this was part of the early case for why, look, 
Um, if you're trying to make distinctions in teacher quality, it might be a good idea to attend to value added as one of the key pieces of information. <coughs> Another part of the selling point was and this is a slide, I generally hate pie charts, uh, but, 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 um, but, but this one came from a different source. Um, so, so this was, uh, uh, this actually comes from Steve Cantrell, who, who works in the, the Measures for Effective Teaching Project. And, and in sort of making the case why you might think about that, that teacher evaluation that's currently constituted without value added is fatally flawed, the case goes something like this. Uh, when you look at sort of all the teachers that get evaluated in LA, US, LA Unified, uh, the, the big blue area is everybody that gets a satisfactory rating. The tiny sliver there are those who are rated as unsatisfactory in LA. Okay? And so the part that's sort of the, the, the kind of punchline on this is if you look at even in that sliver, only in about three quarters of the case did they actually seem to get it right, if you think value added says something about teacher quality. Because what they did was to look at that sliver that had unsatisfactory rating, compute value added estimates, and in that green sliver there, those were teachers that actually were in the top percentile of value added. So even in the 1%, they get rated as unsatisfactory, there's some evidence that they're getting that wrong. And so this is part of the case why teacher evaluation could use some improvement. Okay, so now particularly uh, with my colleagues in this room and with students and other people, um, I, I often have, a, I, I notice a visceral reaction if I mention value added and testing. I mean, if I mention one of those things, I usually get a, a visceral reaction, but the confluence of testing and value added usually evokes some sort of a cringe, right? And so, um, so, so I always find it's helpful to situate the conversation we're having according to this flowchart, okay? And it goes something like this. The question is this. Uh, do you think teachers should be evaluated? Okay. Now, if your answer to that is no, and there are some people who just don't think it's worthwhile to try to figure out a way to evaluate teachers. If your answer to that is no, then we really shouldn't be having a conversation about using tests for value-added purposes, right? Like, there, there's, there's really no point. We should end the conversation there. If your answer is yes, then I can ask you a subsequent question, which is, do you think the evaluation should have stakes attached, right? And a lot of people would actually say to that, no, I think it's a bad idea to put stakes, uh, high stakes on evaluation. And so again, I would say at that point, we should end the conversation. There's no point in talking about using tests for value added. Right? But if you say, yes, actually, I do think there should be some stakes attached, then I think the next question we have to address is this. Should, uh, should evidence of student learning be part of the evaluation, right? And if you agree that evidence of student learning should be part of the evaluation, then we have to have the conversation about value added. It's hard for me to imagine how you would uh, think about incorporating evidence of student learning without something that looked a lot like value added, right? So if you, you know, what, what I don't like are people that have the conversation about the pros and cons of value added and the weaknesses of value added, when the reason they dislike value added is because they don't think teachers should be evaluated and they don't think high stakes should be attached. Those are perfectly reasonable positions, right? But then, have that be your position. Your issue is not with value added, your issue is with high stakes evaluation. Okay, so concerns about value added. Uh, I would put them as, there are two technical concerns. One, uh, are value added estimates accurate? And another one is, are they reliable? Um, and I would say the more difficult concern to address that is more fundamental is, are they valid? Okay, and I'll try to give you some insights to each of these concerns. So I'll start with what I call the LA Times debacle. Uh, in, in, um, on August 14, 2010, um, right around the time we were getting ready to have our faculty retreat, um, there, there came word that if you went to the LA Times, you could find an interface that looked like this, and you could put in a teacher's name or a school, uh, and you could search for that teacher, and if you did that search, here's what you'd find. Uh, and I blacked out the name, but you can see that there is sort of a bar there that says overall value-added effectiveness, math effectiveness, English effectiveness, and the diamond here indicates where the teacher lands. And so this is a poor teacher that has been designated as least effective, uh, both in math and English. Uh, and so sort of that's, that's sort of what you get. Um, and the reason why I call this sort of a, a debacle, and here's another way of presenting it. They show this distribution. Here's where that, this teacher falls in the distribution of value added. The reason I call this a, a debacle is because for a, some period of time, people who've been working on value added methods uh, had been sort of promising, and, and those who'd been sort of trying to get this included as part of a teacher evaluation system, had been promising that it wouldn't be used to shame teachers, it wouldn't be used as this kind of a public system of, you know, of, of tar and feathering an ineffective teacher. And when this came out, it sort of validated all the concerns uh, that people, especially in teachers unions, had about the misuse of value added, right? And so when this came out, um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of conversation, especially in Kevin Wellner's uh, NEPC group, 
uh, about, oh my God, what's happening? But it wasn't just in Kevin's group. A lot of colleagues that I respect a lot who had done a lot of the best research on value added themselves were actually, uh, <laughs> were, were themselves actually quite furious about this uh, because, because they sort of, you know, nobody really uh, thought this was a good idea. And so what, what I, um, at the time, what I, what I said about this is everybody wanted to write some editorials about how this is a misuse. And, and um, if you know me, my response, I, I wanted to get the data. And, and so my, my, my deal with Kevin was that if he could get me the data, um, that I, a, a student and I could work on this, and we would do a reanalysis of the, of the LA Times data uh, and figure out what, what, you know, to what extent it was sensitive to choices they made uh, in, in the construction of the value-added estimates and uh, what was the sort of a reasonable thing to be doing to classifying teachers. Uh, and so the resulting report, uh, something I did with Ben Domang, is called Due Diligence in the Evaluation of Teachers. And what did we find? Well, we did something that was actually not all that complicated. The value-added model they had used uh, for the LA, that had been uh, constructed for the LA Times really only controlled for about four variables. It was a very simple model. It controlled for prior grade uh, achievement in the same subject. It controlled for uh, whether you were new to the school district, uh, whether you were an English uh, language learner, and whether you, uh, your school received Title I funds. Okay. That's it. That was the prediction equation. There was, there was really nothing more included. Um, so what we asked was this, um, knowing the literature, there were a lot of variables that they could have included, but they didn't. Right? So one example of variables they could have included was prior uh, test score performance, even before the prior grade. You could have gone multiple years back and included three years of prior test score performance. Another variable you could have included was a peer effects variable. Does it matter whether you're in a classroom with very high achieving students or, or very low achieving students, whether you're in a remedial class or an AP class? Could that have an, uh, an impact on the estimate of value added? Uh, and then lastly, is there sort of a school, are there, are there sort of school effects? Could you find schools that, where there was a stronger culture in one school versus the other towards, you know, towards, towards uh, improving test scores? Would that matter if you characterize school effects? So what we did is create a new model where we added these three additional variables. And what we just asked was a fairly simple question. If we classified teachers in the same way they had in the LA Times using this new model with additional variables that had pretty good theoretical appeal, would you find differences in where teachers fell in their classifications? And so this is what happened. Um, so so uh, here was the practical impact and sort of the bottom line of the study. Uh, if you say, well, how many teachers will fall in the exact same effectiveness uh, category rating? And recall that there were these four uh, ratings that they had, or uh, had, uh, five ratings they had come up with. And we found that in reading, less than half the time would a teacher fall in exactly the same. Uh, effectiveness rating, and in mathematics, it's a little bit better, but still 40% of the time you would switch classifications. Um, what's maybe even worse is that there were many cases uh, where, especially in reading, where teachers would go from uh, under the one system being labeled as effective versus the other being ineffective uh, or ineffective to effective, right? And you see this is quite differential. It's much more so in reading than math. Uh, one of the things we speculated about is that's because uh, um, they're, they're, that reading is a, is a very different animal, as it turns out, than math for value added. And, and a lot of this I can't go into now, but, but if you sort of think about the, the, the kinds of students you have in LA, where you have a lot of issues with sort of how you identify students and what, you know, how they're learning English and, 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 and what's going on, that there's sort of different things going on in your ability to estimate value add for reading than for, for English. But the bottom line of this was that, look, the way you specify a value add model can matter. And you have to think very carefully about this. And I think that sort of the, the, the positive um, uh, end to this part of the story is that if you go to the LA Times website now, they still do have this interface where you can find a rating for a teacher. But what's changed is that now they show you the results based on four different model specifications right, that include more, uh, fewer or more variables. And so I'd like to say this is one instance where research actually did have uh, some influence on practice because to some extent, Doing this was not me saying that you can't ever use value added and the value added models are inherently wrong. It's just that you're making choices when you do a value added model and you have to let people know what choices you're making and why and let them know whether the outcomes would be sensitive to the choices you're making. And so the extent that the LA Times is doing that now, that's at least a step in the right direction. Okay, another concern uh, with value added is the idea of whether these things are stable. Uh, from one time period to the next. And so here's sort of the worst case kind of scenario where things really don't look very stable at all. Work we've done in Hawaii, um, where we actually, for schools, not for teachers in this case, we computed a value-add estimate from the 2007 to 2008 school year and contrasted it to the value-add estimate from the 2008-2009 school year. And what you can see when you look at the correlation between these estimates, the correlation is pretty low. It's about 0.3. 
right? And that's not, that's not ridiculous. You'll see this in other settings as well. And so if the correlation is only 0.3, there's a great concern that you might see one year a teacher looking ineffective, and then next year it, you can imagine going at least from, to, to sort of average in the distribution, possibly even to effective. And so if you saw teachers jumping from one year to the next into different classifications, it might really undermine faith in the system and it might really be concerned about what's going on. Now, why is this happening? Why is there this instability? The, the way to think about it is to say, well, well, most teachers, anybody who has taught, and we have a lot of people who have taught in the room, would say that from year to year, sometimes you get a great cohort of students, uh, sometimes not so great. And there's some variability there, and you're not sure what, what causes that variability, but there's some sense in which it's the luck of the draw. Some years I get a very cohesive cohort and they do great, other years not so great, right? And so there's some sense in which there's something outside of the control of the teacher just due to chance, and the idea is, you know, can we do something about this? And one way you can sort of see that idea, if there really is this kind of chance variability as a function of the students you get, you might actually expect to see something like what you see in this plot. When you actually look at the value added on the y-axis relative to the number of students that are tested in a given school, what you notice is there's a lot more variability where there are fewer students in a school, right? And as you get more students, that variability tampens down, okay? And so given that that's what you see, one solution to this is, if, is to sort of take in that variability into account and form confidence intervals around the value-added estimates you get. And then you get something that looks like this, where the line here at zero represents essentially a teacher that is average in, in, their, in, in effectiveness. And what you're trying to figure out is how many teachers can you distinguish from that average. And so you form these bars around the estimates. And so these are known as caterpillar plots because they kind of look like caterpillars. And, and what you can see is when you do this, there's actually a relatively uh, small percentage of teachers that you can statistically uh, distinguish from average. Okay? But the fact that you're actually doing this and putting confidence intervals around is one way to take into account the fact that there is this potential instability across time. Okay. So um, one other solution uh, that's been proposed is instead of just trying to compute value added for one year in one cohort, the idea is what if we took rolling averages instead? Okay, so here is using the same data that Ben Domang and I looked at in LA. And what we did here is we actually computed value added for one group and, uh, five years from 2008, five years back, and then from 2009, five years back, right? So the only difference is that we're removing one cohort and adding another one for the, for the subsequent year. So you're building in a structural relationship between the estimates of value added here. And you can see that in this case, your correlation is about 0.96. Right, so there are structural ways to build in reliability if you're willing to take those rolling averages. Okay, so what, you know, the, the things I've just mentioned to you sort of point to the, the, you know, two of the major concerns about value added. One, are we really getting accurate estimates if there's such sensitivity, potential sensitivity to the specification of the model? And the second, how reliable are the value added estimates? And, and I would say that for a, a, a fairly long period of time, um, there was greater concern than there was sort of optimism about the use of value added. And I think that's sort of changed because of two reports in particular that have come out in the last couple of years. And the first one is Chetty, Friedman, and Rockoff that came out at the very end of 2011. Um, and this is a very impressive study. Um, it, it's like I said, this is three talks in one. This is like three studies in one. Uh, that what they did was they constructed value added estimates. Uh, and what they, what they were able to do that few other people had ever been able to do before, and it must just be the Harvard affiliation, uh, they were able to get tax returns uh, on the students. So they were able to link students to the tax returns of their parents. And uh, at the time when they were students in school, and then later they were actually to find out information on student earnings many years after they had gone through the schooling system. By the fact that they had tax returns on the, t on the parents, they were able to compute value added the way you typically would if you didn't have that information. Right? So you can't include those variables as predictors in the model and control for those sorts of things. And now you can ask the question, okay, now we have these extra variables that might capture things about poverty or socioeconomic status that we don't typically have available to us in school databases. And so they can look at the correlation between the value added and those extra variables. And when they did, there's basically no correlation. Right? And so this was some evidence that the things that they were computing as value added, the way they were getting at that, we're not really sensitive to, they're not something that is really sensitive to, to a socioeconomic status. A second thing they were able to do is to actually follow teachers that had switched schools. Okay, so they went from one school to the next, and this created essentially a quasi-experimental setting where they're able to ask the question, if value added is real, when a teacher leaves a school, we should see the average value added at that school drop, and we sh if, if, I'm sorry, if a high value added teacher leaves a school, 
we should see the value added for that, that school drop, and we should see the school where they enter, we should see it increase by a little bit. Right? And so that's, in fact, what they show pretty persuasively is that's exactly what happens. When a high-value-added teacher leaves, you see value-added drop the next year at that school, and you also see uh, a value-added rise at the other school, and vice versa. When a low-value-added uh, teacher leaves, you see, uh, you, you see, you see the, the opposite pattern occur. And, and probably the part that's gotten the most press is that this was the first study that was able to look at value-added outcomes long-term. So they were to look at a, a student that had a high, what was considered a highly effective teacher by value added, and then to look in the end, do you see any association with future income earnings for that student? Do you see that they're more likely to go to college? Um, and the, the impacts, the effects they found were fairly small, but they were impacts. And they did show, sort of this was the first study to show there is some long-term impact of value added. It suggests this isn't just something um, that's a bit of a complete illusion. The other study that's been most, uh, most sort of uh, persuasive on that there's something to value added uh, is the Measures of Effective Teaching Project. Um, and, and here what they were able to do is a randomized experiment where they were able to compute value added for teachers one year, then randomly assign uh, those teachers to different class lists of students. And what they were trying to say is once we've randomly assigned teachers to different groups of students, right, at that point the only thing that should predict differences across teachers should be the amount of their, their value added because the, 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 there's, just, there's nothing other than sort of chance for what group uh, list of, of students they get in their classroom. And in fact, that's what they saw. They found that value added is very predictive of the mean differences in achievement between students across these classrooms. And so once again, this is sort of uh, fairly good evidence that there's something to value added, that, it, that it's not just capturing noise, that it's not completely biased. Um, and so their argument through this study was that volatility, can, you know, the other concern, can be dampened by creating composites that's not just value added, but other observations of, student, uh, of uh, teaching practice, that that can help you with volatility, uh, and that you could also pool across multiple years in the way that I just demonstrated. Okay, and then the last is, is you know, the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. We can't accept the idea that for, in order for value added to be used, it has to be perfectly reliable or perfectly accurate that isn't sort of a reasonable bar. Okay, and so I mentioned finally that this sort of gets at these issues of accuracy and reliability, but what we're going to need to see more of as these things get used in accountability systems is people doing more what I would call validity studies. And a great example of this is a study by Hill, Capitula, and Upland, where what they did is uh, Heather Hill had, had a lot of uh, experience uh, constructing uh, protocols uh, and surveys that got at sort of the mathematical quality of instruction that you would observe in a classroom. And so what she was able to do with, uh, with her colleagues is go into a lot, a lot of classrooms where she actually knew uh, the value added, she was able to compute value added for the teachers. So that what you see in this plot on the horizontal axis is the value added estimates for the teachers' the classrooms that she visited. And then on the vertical axis is the scores based on the observation protocols of the quality of instruction, that, the mathematical instruction that they observed. Now the part that I found very interesting about this is that what most people tend to be worried about, myself included, when you think about the misuse of value added, is you worry about false negatives. That a teacher, based on value added, would look ineffective, but if you just went into the classroom, you'd see this is one of the best teachers ever. Uh, and, and so, if you'll notice in this plot, there were no false negatives. In this quadrant here, where here is where you would say these are people that have, are very low in the value added rating, and here is somebody that's very high in mathematical quality instruction, there was nobody that landed in that quadrant. And so what was very surprising to me that instead of false negatives, what you had was actually a lot of false positives. Right? And the reason you see these false positives is actually a little bit of a function of the model. In this value-added model, they're not controlling for uh, peer effects. Okay? And so what was probably going on in these classrooms, even though when they went into the classroom, the kinds of mathematics instructions was actually teaching misconceptions about mathematics. And it's very compelling if you read the article that it's very clear that the teachers were misteaching mathematics. But the speculation is that the students are able to compensate uh, by going home and getting extra instruction at home or having parents that work with them or their peers are able to get together in study groups. Okay? And so since this value add model doesn't control for peer effects, that's why you see this. Okay. Okay. So just to bring this, this last point to sharp relief, Here's an example, and I realize you can't read the axis here, but the horizontal axis here shows percentage of students that are in a school that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Okay? So here, these are, these are schools that have much more, a much larger congregation of high poverty of students in poverty, uh, and these are uh, clearly the, the wealthier schools that have fewer students in poverty. And then this, on the y-axis, is, is an estimate of value added for a school. This is data coming from Missouri, and uh, in this, 
brings into sharp relief clear policy decisions that you have to make because this is the same data, but it shows two entirely different relationships between value added and poverty. The value add model on the left has a clear relationship with poverty, right? That is, if you go to higher poverty schools, you will see on average schools that have lower value added, right? On the right, that's not true at all. No matter what the level of poverty, you see the same distribution of value added. Okay? So which one's right? It's unclear. It depends a little bit on what you believe to be the case about true teacher quality. Right? And which one is the one that you actually want to implement as policy, that's another unclear point. So my economist friends like the one on the right. Okay? The reason they, want, they like the one on the right is because they don't want to have any disincentives for teachers to enter a labor market and say, oh, if I go to a certain school, I might get a low value added rating, hence I should go to the higher, you know, the lower poverty school. So they want a model that looks like this that shows that no matter what school you go to, you have equal chance of showing up as an effective teacher based on value added. But I raise this question, do we all believe, in fact, the higher quality teachers are in uh, equally distributed among lower and higher poverty schools? And if you don't believe that's true and you actually think that it's quite plausible that higher quality teachers are in lower poverty schools, then you want this picture because you want people to see, in fact, that there's an equity in the quality of teachers from the, across schools. And this picture on the left shows that. But it's not an easy decision. It's not clear that there's any one right answer. Okay, and I'll, I'll just, um, this is one thing. So, so what this sort of turns to, and I'm, this is sort of my segue to the psychometric perspective, uh, which is that one of the things we don't appreciate enough is that a key question is value added to what? What test outcome should you be using? And it turns out that even more then the specification of what variables are in the model, value added is very sensitive to what outcome measure you use. Okay? And here's one thing that's just not well appreciated, and so I do it as a little uh, interactive exercise. Um, so, so this is data from Colorado, and what it shows is correlations across grades uh, between the math CSAP from one grade to the next and the reading CSAP from one grade to the next. Okay? And what I'm showing here is just correlations from grade five to grade six. So the correlation for math from grade five to six is 0.88, from reading from grade five to six, six, it's also 0.88. And so here's what I ask you. As we go from grade five to grade seven, grade five to grade eight, grade five to grade nine, what's gonna happen to the correlation? Where are my students? Come on. <laughs> what's gonna happen? Is it gonna go down? Okay, Lori is willing to, willing to offer a guess. She says it's going to go down in math and stay the same in reading. Everybody, what did everybody else think? It's going to go down, period. Okay, well, let's go to the videotape. Okay, here's the correlation, grade 7. Here's the correlation, grade 8. Here's the correlation, grade 9. Okay, just recognize the correlation has dropped from 0.88 from grade 5 to 6 to 0.83 from 5 to 9 with an interviewing, interviewing four grades. And I just make this point to say that most people don't think this is what you would, they, they expect to see. This is very counterintuitive to people. And I, I just use it as a teaser to say that we have a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to what our outcome variables are, how sensitive they are to instruction, what we expect in terms of stability over time. And I just leave that as a teaser. I have more work on this, but I don't have time for it. Okay, so best case scenario for the economic model. Okay, is that you have better, in teacher, better teacher and principal evaluations lead to improvements in, in teaching and learning. Uh, value add measures level the playing field and help objectively identify struggling exemplary teachers. Uh, teachers and principals respond positively to high stakes incentives uh, and more talented teachers enter the workforce because they think they'll be rewarded for merit. Worst case scenario, uh, Campbell's Law, right? Campbell's Law holds that as soon as you start putting high stakes um, on quantitative me uh, measures, it starts corrupting those measures, right? There's an incentive for people to, to game the system. Uh, it also is going to create a lot more paperwork. So there's an opportunity cost lost in the paperwork that, that's involved in doing evaluation every year. Uh, it might be the best teachers just leave. You know, they, don't, they don't need this. They, they resent uh, the infringement on their autonomy. Inequality could get worse. Uh, and there could be this decrease in teacher and principal mo uh, morale. And just to kind of highlight that, this is the MetLife survey uh, and ask the question each year, something along the lines of how satisfied would you say you are with your job as a teacher in the public schools? And, um, the, the very last time point, 2011, you see that there's actually been from 2009 the largest change from from one two-year period to the, or from one two-year period to the next. Right? There's no other magnitude of changes as large as the one we see from 2009 to 2011. Now I don't want to overread this because if you 
if you add, this is basically those who say that they're very satisfied. If you combine very satisfied with somewhat satisfied, you still get a fairly large number of teachers that are on the sort of positive at the end of the satisfaction continuum. But clearly there's some evidence here of a decrease in teacher morale. Okay, so this brings us to the psychometric perspective. Uh, if you're a geek like me, you know, you know who that is. Uh, uh, and, and you know something here. And, and what you'll see is that these represent two different extremes in the psychometric perspective. Um, and so the question you have to ask is this. A real concern about the economic perspective is Campbell's Law. And so I'll use that as a jumping off point and ask the following question. Can Campbell's Law be subverted? And I'll talk about two approaches we might think about how we could possibly subvert Campbell's Law by taking what I call the psychometric perspective. And the first is, well, what if we could just build large-scale assessments that are actually worth teaching to? So if the big concern is that when you impose high-stakes accountability based on tests, teachers are going to teach the tests, one response is, build better tests. If you build better tests and they teach the tests, great. Okay. Um, another one, though, that I think is not as well appreciated, an approach you could take is, how can we empower teachers to take ownership of the assessments used to measure growth? Okay. And I actually think this is the most promising one for subverting Campbell's Law. Okay. So, um, but the teaching to the test perspective goes something like this. The argument's like this. Uh, we have now uh, recently implemented in the last few years the Common Core of State Standards. Um, and if you uh, look, so you can see that you know, the, the number of states that have adopted the act, there's only five states that haven't. Uh, some of them are fairly predictable. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but, but um, one of the points is if you look at the Common Core State Standards, you would actually be very hard pressed to say that they aren't an improvement over what's come before. There's just no question that if one of the concerns about content standards in the past was that they were an inch deep uh, and a mile wide, you don't see that same thing in the, in the Common Core. There's much more emphasis on depth of understanding, um, on showing linkages across grades. Um, in particular in math, that there's focal content in math that you would see more in one grade and it changes across grades. That there's some coherence across what you're expecting in terms of reading comprehension uh, over grades. The Common Core clearly represents an improvement over content standards that we've had in the past from state to state. And the fact that so many states have now signed on to be hopefully aligning their instruction to the same standards, that to me represents an improvement over what we've seen in the past. The other possible improvement is that we now have lar uh, two uh, large-scale testing consortia developing assessments uh, that would be connected, at, uh, at aligned to the Common Core state standards. So I, the two of them are Smarter Balanced and PARC. Uh, um, I, I, I'm on the technical advisory committees of both of those. Um, and I focus on PARC here because PARC is the test that Colorado has signed up to take. Uh, and so you can see there the states that are part of PARC. Um, and here are the ambitions for PARC, is to create a common set of K-12 assessments, uh, English and math anchored to what it takes to be ready for college and careers. Uh, these new K-12 assessments will build a pathway to college and career readiness by the end of high school, mark students' progress towards this goal from third grade up, provide teachers with timely information and form instruction, to provide student support. So the PARC assessments do everything. They will repair your kitchen sink. Uh, anything you need, the PARC assessments will probably do for you. Uh, and, and the nuts, nuts and bolts of them are that they consist of the following. The idea is that if a state signs up to be a full participant in the park assessment, they could have at the beginning of the year diagnostic assessments that they could administer. Uh, they'd have mid-year assessments. These are known as interim assessments that would be predictive of likely student performance at the end of the year. Um, they will also consist of performance-based assessments that will have a pretty large component of the final summative score will be based on performance-based work. And these performance-based assessments will be quite different from what we've seen students take in the past. They're not just constructive response items. They really requ require multi-step reasoning um, and, and, and critical inferences and the sorts of things that people use the jargon of 21st century skills. Well, a lot of those are really going to find a home in the performance-based assessment, plus you're going to have this end-of-year assessment. And if you actually look at the kinds of things that the people designing these assessments are trying to do, once again, you'd be hard pressed to say that if in fact they were successful at building tests that were really relevant to, to student experiences and really captured, uh, or connected to real, world, to real world experiences and really uh, um, uh, focused on depth of knowledge, not just breadth of knowledge, you'd be hard pressed to say that the park assessments aren't an improvement over what we've had before. So there is something to be said for this idea that yes, if, you know, if they're going to be teaching the test, they will be probably teaching to a better test. And so where, where does a psychometrician fit in to this landscape that I've just described? And I want to give you two ways in which a psychometrician fits in. And I want to make a contrast between a psychometrician as a test technician, which is why I think people have negative uh, perspectives on psychometrics, uh, and, and a psychometrician as an assessment engineer. Okay. So why do we need psychometricians as test technicians? Well, we do need technicians. If you break your leg uh, walking down the stairs after this talk, 
uh, you're going to go see, get an x-ray taken, uh, and you're going to want a very good x-ray technician. So I don't think we need to malign the technicians, right? Uh, and, and what does a technician do? Well, a technician can help you build tests with target levels of reliability and precision at different points of the score scale. It can help you equate uh, uh, tests across different forms from year to year so that you don't think that a, 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 if the test changes from year to year, you don't want to uh, negatively impact a student who happens to take it in a given year. And test technicians can help you see if there are any obvious signs that the items are biased against certain groups of students. These are things that test technicians can actually do and do as part of every testing contract that a company gets. And this is an example of what sort of a tech, test technician will look at in terms of that measurement reliability. And what this is showing is here on the uh, x-axis are proficiency scores. On the y-axis is an estimate of precision of measurement on the measurement scale. And you can say depending on where you put your items on the test, the difficulty of the items, you can get precision at different points in the scale. So if what you really want is precision right in the middle, you're going to make sure you have items of this level of difficulty. If you really want precision further out here, you're going to want to be able to spread your items along that proficiency continuum. And if you want it further out here, you really need to spread them out along the proficiency continuum. And a, a, a psychometrician as test technician can help you in designing a test that way because they can look at the properties of the items you're using. So clearly important stuff to do. Uh, if you're building assessments to get a growth, you really care about having precision at the ends of the scale. right? Because if you have floor and ceiling effects in the assessment you're using, it's going to be very difficult to talk about progress or growth from grade to grade. Okay. What I want to focus on here, and this is particularly germane to my students, is that um, my, my students, I tell them, you're more than a test technician. You should be able to do the things that a test technician can do. But what we really need are psychometricians that are what I call assessment engineers. Now, I thought about using the term learning scientists, but my colleagues in the learning scientists seem to have a negative perspective on us psychometricians. So it seems like that term is sort of relegated for something else. But I could have that conversation. That I don't understand why psychometricians aren't seen as a central component of what the learning sciences should be about. Okay. So the idea of assessment engineering is that there's a tight coupling between design and use. Okay. We learn from past efforts. We work in teams with different specializations. We place trade-offs front and center. We stress test the system before it, gets, it goes to scale. And that we have foresight to think about the coherence between classroom and large-scale assessment. And I, I do think that the engineering perspective is catching on. And you can see some signs of that in some of the books that have come out over the last 10 years. The very famous NRC report, Knowing What Students Know, Denny Borsboom's book, Measuring the Mind, uh, Paul DeBuke and Mark Wilson's book, Explanatory Item Response Modeling, are all examples that I think are consistent with the notion of, uh, of a psychometrician as not just a technician, but an assessment engineer. You can also see it a little bit in the design, the structure of the designs for PARC which really tout themselves, both park and smarter balances, as embracing evidence-centered design. So rather than saying, we're just building a test of math and a test of English language arts, what they actually will do is say, here are specific claims we are trying to make in these subject domains about what students should know and be able to do at certain grades. And so an example of one of the claims that you can pull from, the, from that they have online is that in math, the, uh, the, uh, the student expresses appropriate mathematical reasoning by constructing viable arguments critiquing the reasoning of others, and are attending to precision and making mathematical statements. Right? And so you would, the idea is you pick items that would help you elicit information as to whether, in fact, these things are actually happening. Right? And the same thing with English language arts. You can see that they're actually putting forward, here are claims that the test has to support. We're going to build items that help us provide evidence towards these claims, and that will help us make in the back end a validity argument as to whether the tests are doing what they need to do. Okay? So um, I wanted to give you a... a, a illustration of, of assessment engineering. And I'm going to make this very fast because I'm sort of running low on time and my last part of the talk is probably the most important. So uh, uh, I don't want to spend too much on this. But one, th one point I want to make is that assessment engineering is a real, it's still not easy for my colleagues in psychometrics to think this way. Uh, and you run into this all the time uh, uh, when, when I have conversations with them is that they want a lot of things out of their tests but they're not, they're not sort of comfortable with sort of the way that you have to sort of think about things in order to have tests do those things. Right? And so one example is I might have a colleague that says, please build us a test system with a score scale from grade to grade that can be used to support statements such as Jessica grew twice as much as Mike in her understanding of math from grade three to four. OK. And so um, the reason why I might have trouble with that request under the kind of traditional way we build tests is that traditionally large-scale assessments have been built with what I would call a domain sampling approach. So if you look on the Common Core and pick any particular grade, you can list the different domains that mathematics is broken up into. 
right? And the one way I could build a test is say, well, these are the domains of mathematical content and the lines represent the practices. The best way for me to build a test is essentially sample, build, build items that connect to each domain. And then I just try to draw inferences from the items that are on the test for the domains of mathematics I care about, okay? But there's a different way to think about building a test. That's what I call a learning progression design, okay? And so here's sort of what it looks like. In the bottom end, it says, we start by saying, well, how and what uh, how and what do students think about a concept at time point x? Okay? And then we ask, well, how does that change over time? Okay, they start the school year, this is how they're thinking. How does that thinking change over the course of, of a semester or school year? And then what's my target for conceptual understanding at point y? Okay? And what is the curriculum in which these concepts are situated? Okay? What are the teaching moves that will best facilitate learning? Okay? If you're building a test from this perspective, you have very different um, warrants for statements about growth. And just to illustrate that, here's putting these two designs side by side. If what you want to do is say, make statements about growth from grade to gro grade to grade. In the domain sampling approach, you'll notice I have all these different shapes here. And to the extent the domains actually change and the standards within a domain change from grade to grade, if you just give me one number across all the domains in one grade and another number in the following grade, what it means to say that there's growth is ambiguous because I could have growth for many different reasons, right? In contrast with the learning progression approach, you're holding a particular concept constant from grade to grade and, and trying to get a sense for how it's becoming more sophisticated and changing. And that's a hypothesis that you're testing. It's a very different way of thinking about growth, okay? And so another example, if we were re trying to measure reading comprehension, uh, this is an example where I, 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 I could follow through and show you how I could start with a hypothesis about what I would need to capture growth and how I need to design a test. Um, and then I can actually show you sort of the best case scenario for what that could look like. Now, I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna skip this particular example, uh, but maybe in questions, if you wanna know more about it, I'd be happy to share it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so does the Common Core support a learning progression design perspective? Well, it's clear that in, in the design of that, there was some thought that eventually it could. It doesn't right now, and there's, a little bit, there's quite a bit too much rhetoric around the idea that the common core are learning progressions. There's maybe the, the seeds for learning progressions, but a lot more work would have to be done before you could really take a learning progression design for assessments. Okay, and so how would I respond to this sort of request? I'd say, well, if you want me to build a, a, a test score scale to capture growth, what do you really mean by growth? Growth of what exactly? Are you willing to trade off breadth for depth if you take a learning progression approach, which would be most consistent with growth? Uh, and if you want to develop a no, score scale, uh, how are you going to falsify it? How do I know if the resulting scale is, is worthy or not? Right? What am I going to look for? Okay. Um, the last part of this I, where I think this was sort of the teaching to the test approach. The other approach that we could sort of think from the psychometric perspective is how do you empower teachers to take ownership of the test that they use in their classroom? And so here is an example where for people that were, have been a part of these evaluation systems early on, there was a real sense, if you looked at the 50% that's the student growth, well, the state test, the CSAP, only really uh, uh, is available for about a third of teachers in K through 12 settings, right? So what about the other two thirds? And most people initially saw this as a big obstacle to teacher evaluation. Could, how can you get uh, value-add estimates of growth when you have to potentially build all these new tests? And, and I've actually come to see that actually this is the saving grace to possibly the, the evaluation system and not the obstacle because it might be what I consider a Trojan horse for how you could embed important formative principles and embedded assessment principles into a system and get teachers to buy into actually thinking this might be worth doing. Okay. So student growth objectives is an example of how you would go about in this last area thinking about uh, growth and, and sort of the questions you ask under student growth objectives. Where are kids at the start of the school year? Uh, what do we want them to learn? What evidence will we need to convince ourselves and others, which is important, uh, that they have learned? Uh, how do our aspirations for growth compare to what we actually observe? And how do we improve our craft as a teacher, as teachers as a result? I don't think anybody would disagree that these are the, the kind of good questions to be getting teachers to ask themselves. The problem we have right now is that we're falling short with the way SGOs are being implemented in schools, in the districts that are implementing them because they see it as this compliance, bureaucratic thing they have to do. And if you can get people to see that these are the questions that underlie creating student growth objectives, you could say, well, that's actually quite valuable. I believe in that. And if you could say that the growth component in teacher evaluation will be based on you asking these kinds of questions, not just of yourself, but with your colleagues in the same content area, 
then I think you have a great chance potentially to get teachers to buy in. And it reminds me of this requirement, you know, there's all this rhetoric around the use of park tests and things like that formatively. But it's worth reminding um, four criteria that Wilson and Sloan discussed that you really need to have in place if you want teachers to use tests formatively. One, you need teachers to be involved in the process of collecting and selecting student work. Two, teachers have to be able to score and use their results immediately. You can't have to wait uh, many months for the, the results to be returned. And teachers have to be able to interpret the results in instructional terms. And they have to have a creative role in the way the assessment system is realized in their classroom. So to me, this is where we need to go in these evaluation systems. This is where a psychometric perspective, thinking about principles of evidence-centered design and the like, bringing that into the classroom and working with teachers so they don't see it just as a bureaucratic hoop that they're jumping, but as something that's really genuinely getting at stuff they care about, they should care about passionately as teachers. OK. So your best case scenario in the psychometric perspective is that the state consortia create truly innovative assessment systems. Uh, teachers and schools are better able to prepare students for college and career. Instruction standards and assessments are aligned. Emphasis on student growth leads to greater dialogue and introspection. Uh, teacher teams take ownership of student assessment. And your worst case scenario, assessment systems that are developed just don't live up to the hype. Uh, states only adopt the summative component. You'll notice those other components were, were not mandatory. Uh, tests have either no influence on instruction or the wrong kinds of influence. Uh, concept of student growth is nebulous because we're still taking this domain sampling approach. Uh, and psychometricians stay on the sideline. They only play the, the technician role. Okay. So I've given you a very nice uh, academic talk up to now. Uh, but, but at this point, I have to give you a slightly different talk, and that's from my perspective as the father of a special needs child. And this is a very emotional uh, um, uh, topic for me, and so this is one where I just will kind of resort to notes. Okay. So this is my son, Lucas. Uh, he's currently nine years old. This was taken when he was uh, still seven years old on a family trip to London, England. Uh, as you can see, he's a beautiful boy. Uh, he's a very affectionate kid. He's got a mischievous sense of humor. He's got a deep and infectious laugh, and he has phenomenal powers of observation. And these are the qualities that define him. Um, now, he also has autism, and that's a quality that's come to define me and my wife. Uh, now, the general public is starting to become more familiar with the hallmarks of autism. Autism is fundamentally a communication disorder associated with repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. But when Whitney and I explain it, we put it something like this. Uh, a, a child that's on the autism spectrum is a lot like an orchestra without a conductor. Right? Uh, there's no one to organize the different instruments that play in Lucas's head. From hour to hour, those instruments often seem to play without rhyme or reason, and he just seems sometimes at a loss for which one to pay attention to. And life should not be so hard for such a sweet little boy. So as parents, the job of conductor falls onto us, and it's a job that starts the second Lucas wakes up in the morning, and it ends the second after he falls asleep at night. And learning is not something that we've ever been able to take for granted where Lucas is concerned. What we've discovered is that without a clearly defined structure, without a plan for how we're going to get him from point A to B to C, Lucas will not learn. At least he won't learn at a rate that will give him a chance to call his own shots in life. So as parents, we've learned humility the hard way. So we admit when we're stuck, which happens a lot, and we seek out ideas from others. We're desperate to find new ways to reach Lucas, to bring out the potential he knows there, and the older he gets, the further we saw him, see him falling behind his peers, the more desperate we become. About a month ago, Whitney and I have met with two of Lucas's teachers from his public elementary school. One serves as a school special education coordinator. The other is a third grade teacher in his general education classroom. Lucas spends about 75% of his day in the general classroom with support from a paraeducator. And we'd arranged this meeting because we'd noticed some troubling developments since Lucas had returned to school after the new year. Prior to the break, he'd been participating in daily reading groups with his third grade peers, and we'd been noticing some signs of improvement when we worked with him on his reading at home. Now, following the break, time allocated to these reading groups had been cut in half. And for a period of two to three weeks, while students were being prepared to take the state-mandated assessments, uh, there was going to be no reading groups at all. Now, during the time the other students were spending on test preparation, Lucas was to be receiving direct instruction from the special education coordinator. But our question was, what kind of instruction? And one of the underappreciated consequences of NCLB was that it required uh, states to include students with significant cognitive disabilities in annual assessments of academic achievements. This is what I view as one of the untold success stories of No Child Left Behind. These students take a different version of the assessments known as alternate, alternate assessment with alternate achievement standards. The basic idea in most states is to design these assessments by starting from the same content standards used for the general student population and building what are known as downward extensions 
and make it possible for students with cognitive disabilities to access these standards at a lower level of complexity. So we called this meeting with Lucas's teachers in part because I was wondering why preparing for the state assessments would entail the disruption of reading groups, if it's a good pedagogical strategy. Two, whatever was being done to prepare the other students, why wouldn't that have an obvious extension for Lucas? Uh, and, and why had nobody from his, the school given us any information at all on what Lucas should expect by taking the Colorado's alternate assessment, which is known as the co-alt? So we gathered in a conference room in, in the school for a 30-minute meeting on a Friday afternoon. And after a few minutes of small talk, I posed the teachers the following question. How is the instruction Lucas is receiving aligned to the content of the alternate assessment he'll be taking within the next few weeks? Now, to be fair, this was not an innocent question. <laughs> I'm currently a TAC member on one of the consortia that are developing alt assessments. I know quite a bit about how they're developed and how they're supposed to be aligned. Um, so I have a pretty good sense for that. But what I wanted to see was how the teachers would respond to my question. And I, and I thought one of two things might happen. Option one was the teachers would give me the politically correct answer, which goes something like this. Well, we make every effort to ensure that Lucas's instruction is aligned to the extension of Colorado's content standards for students with cognitive disabilities. So I would consider this response as something like the most plausible scenario, because that's the right way to respond. You don't want to get in trouble. Possibility two was that the teachers would reject the premise that Lucas's instruction should be aligned to the content of the co-alt. They might argue that it's most important to tailor his instruction to the goals of his IEP. So, so you know, just doing this leaves him no time to worry about the co-alt. And this seemed like it would be a very honest answer, and I'm, I would have disagreed with it, but it would have kind of given us a, a basis for dialogue. And so the, the one answer I wasn't expecting was no answer. What I got was silence, crickets chirping. Um, and all I could finally get after a while, after what silence that seemed to go on forever, is a special education coordinator saying, I'll have to get back to you on that. Weeks later, she still hadn't. Uh, and I'm still kind of waiting for a clear answer on it. So as we continued to talk, it became more and more apparent to me that Lucas's teachers were unable to make any connection between the instruction he was getting and any objective that suggests Lucas was or was not actually learning. What they cared about was demonstrating that Lucas was being included and participating in the general classroom activities. His general ed teacher actually asked me, what do you see as the difference between participation and learning? Okay. And it was clearly to me a rhetorical question because I'm pretty sure that as far as she is concerned, the two are indistinguishable. And what you have to appreciate is that, coming from a parent perspective, what you feel in these rooms is a sense that the best they can do is teach my kid functional skills, that actually academic skills is asking too much. And this is not just based on my perception in the room. The National Center uh, for, that's developing alt assessments actually did a survey where they asked special ed teachers the following questions about students. Uh, it is important that students with significant cognitive disabilities have access to the same ideas and content that their same age typical peers are learning. Less than one third of special education teachers speculated that all or most of their peers would agree with that statement. Students with the most significant cognitive disabilities should master functional skills or daily life skills before beginning to learn academics like reading and mathematics. About two thirds of special education teachers speculated all or most of their peers would agree with that. And so when you're in that room, and that's what you feel as an undertone, even if it's not being stated, that's the last thing you want to hear. So, of course, I left that meeting with steam coming out of my ears. <laughs> and what I did is I immediately went to the Colorado Department of Education website. I downloaded the con extended content standards for third grade, and I put together an email explaining uh, how the co-op was meant to connect to the curriculum uh, that, that, that they'd be using, that the content standards, what alignment was supposed to mean. I even gave some examples. I wrote in the email, here's an example. Evidence for reading comprehension. Uh, students should be able to sequence three illustrations, identify the main character. This is all taken from the extended content standards on the CDE website. This is no mystery. It took me five minutes to get. Um, and so uh, at the end of the email, I asked again, how is this instruction Lucas is receiving aligned to these expectations? And weeks later, I still hadn't really gotten an answer. Uh, my wife was informed by the assistant director of special education at a recent meeting that, uh, the, that BVSD hadn't been told that they need to align Colorado's expanded content standards to IEP goals. And I'm not sure if I should be reassured by that. Okay, now as a researcher, I'm trained to be suspicious of anecdotes, and I expect you to be as well. But just to put the story in context, as many as you probably know, Boulder uh, generally gets the cream of the crop when it comes to teacher applicants. Uh, the school where Lucas attends is considered the place to go if you have a kid on the autism spectrum. We have a supportive principal, we have great kids, and we generally love the community. Uh, and most of the teachers there are very well-intentioned. 
So I'd say what we're experiencing, the frustrations that we're, frustrations that we're experiencing, um, is really a best case scenario for a student with special needs, not just in Boulder, probably in the state. It opens the door to greater parent involvement through clear communication about what and how much children are learning, then I think this will be a positive development. Second, the success of educational accountability will depend on how stories like these accumulate. Once the doors to a conference room close, and it's just the parents and teachers talking, all the best intentions, the economic and psychometric perspectives may go right out the window if teachers either don't understand what the system is designed to accomplish or they refuse to buy into it. And third, educational accountability might not be popular among teachers or even among my colleagues, but it could be incredibly empowering, especially for the parents of a disadvantaged student. What we need are teachers that are, among other things, creative, flexible, curious, and above all else, dedicated to consistent improvement of their craft. And in my view, the latter can only happen when we nourish a culture in public education where teachers and school leaders are regularly willing to ask and attempt to answer some hard questions about how much and how their students appear to be learning. Can educational accountability make this a reality? I guess we're going to find out. Thank you.